first of all, I want to say thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, I live up in Lake Tahoe, and so to come down here, it's been a couple days. What a, what a great place. The sun shines out, and our weather's changing a little bit now, so it's getting a little colder. But thank you for coming out tonight. <clears throat> I want to start off by first saying, hopefully I don't lose my voice. I'll probably need some water. I'm the luckiest guy on the planet. And I'm going to give you three reasons why. Number one, I have my wife with me tonight. And you see, she has watched me from the very beginning to have a dream. And she watched me work extremely hard and to obtain that dream. And that's why I'm here tonight to talk about our dreams and talk about how to obtain those dreams because we're always going to have roadblocks, right? And we're going to talk about how to take those roadblocks and turn them into opportunities. Because if you look at it that way, then it's gonna just be so much easier for you. And the third reason why I'm the luckiest guy on the planet here is that I get to share this information with you tonight. You see, this industry has been tremendously good for me. I live up in Lake Tahoe, I travel when I want to, I've made a, a little bit of money over the years, a lot of money over the years. <laughs> And it hasn't been easy. I'm not going to tell you it's easy, right? But boy, what a ride. It's been enjoyable. I've been in federal court. I sued a, a little toy company years ago, Legos. And, the, and our system works. Our patenting system absolutely 100% worked for me, right? So you have to believe in it. You have to support it. So those are three reasons why I'm the luckiest guy on the planet. Because I get to share now that I've been into this industry for so long, I, I need to give back, right? Because someone helped me when I first started out. His name was Steve Askin. I was a young man. I thought I was crazy. My parents thought I was crazy. My, my friends thought I was just absolutely out of my mind. And he gave me hope because he told me, you're not crazy. You can do this. And without that one bit of advice, I don't think I'd be here today, right? So we're going to talk about community. We're going to talk about being around other people that can help you achieve your dreams because you're going to need a lot of help. You, can, you cannot do it by yourself. So those are the three reasons why I'm so happy to, to be here tonight. So there you go, you guys. We're going to talk about removing the roadblocks to your success. And the reason why that's really so important to me is that I still have roadblocks today. I've been doing it for 30 years. I still have them today. They're never going to go away. So you have to look at them differently. How many people are watching my YouTube channel, InventRight TV? Raise your hand. All right, if you haven't, check it out. It's absolutely free. See, I believe in giving back. I wrote this book called One Simple Idea. How many people have read One Simple Idea? Uh, thank you very much. I have this 10-step system that's worked for me. And I was contacted from McGraw-Hill five years ago and said, look, Steve, we want you to pour everything into this 10-step system that you sell as a course for one year called InventRight and put it in the book for $20. This took 30 years for me to figure this out. You want me to put it in the book for $20? And uh, uh, one of my students that I was teaching, his name was Tim Ferriss. How many people have heard of Tim Ferriss before our work week? I called Tim up and I said, Tim, what should I do? They want me to write this book, but they want, to give, they want me to give away everything. He said, Steve, if you're truly an expert, give it away. And that's exactly what I did. It's called One Simple Idea. It's a yellow book. We're selling hundreds of thousands of copies. It's still selling well. We just did a revised edition. If you don't have it, please pick it up because things are changing so quick, I had to rewrite it again. This whole industry is changing quickly, so we have to be extremely um, aware of it. InventRight TV. Uh, we have our own channel. If you haven't checked it out, we have a fun time. I have my partner Andrew Krauss that I started InventRight over 16 years ago. We also have a patent attorney giving away free advice now. How many patent, well, first of all, how many patent attorneys do we have here? Any, any in the crowd? No? <laughs> they never raise their hand. <laughs> So a patent attorney is going to give away free advice? Are you crazy? Check it out. His name is Damon Callie. He's wonderful. He's an inventor first. That's what I love about this guy. He started as an engineer, became an inventor, went back, 
and uh, now he's a patent attorney, but he gives you the real deal, and I'm going to ask him the hard questions. Right? I'm going to tear it apart. I'm going to ask some questions no one's asking because I do have patents. I've been through the whole litigation and I want to talk a little bit about the value of patents too because that's a tricky question there. So anyway, InventRight TV, we also have two of my main coaches. They have their own channel, Amy Jo. She's going to talk about licensing. She's licensed ideas, David Fidewa, one of my senior coaches at InventRight. He's licensed three or four ideas now. The guy's on fire is a young man. He's going to give you tips. You're not going to hear from anybody else. I like to provide this information absolutely free. Grab it, get it, it's there. I also write for three magazines, about 3,000 words a week. Entrepreneur.com for over three years, Inc. now and Core 77. Core 77 is where the real product developers are coming up with ideas. They've paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to be educated to come up with ideas. So I'm down in Los Angeles last week giving a presentation at Core 77. And I have a few students here. How many students do I have here in InventRight? Raise your hand, please. Okay, great, thank you guys. And so, one of their top designers, after I gave a talk, we have a little round table, they're sitting there, one of my students is sitting there, and she's talking about the process. She's talking about calling companies, she's talking about manufacturing, she's talking about designs, she's talking about everything, and the, the top designer looks over and goes, you must be a designer, right? And she goes, no, I'm a nurse. He couldn't believe what he heard. You see, you guys, we can do this. All of us can. And you don't have to have a, you know, some type of title. You don't need it. What you need is your dream. And you need a road map for that dream. And you have to realize there's going to be some obstacles along the way. And that's what we're going to talk about. So let me see if I can get this to work. The red button? Like the blue, it's like the blue pill? The red button? Let's see. All right here. Oh, okay. A little background. I have 20 patents. I'm a big patent holder. I love patents. I sold my company called Spin Labels with 20 patents, and it's been a great ride. I collected royalties for over 20 years on, on an idea that I didn't invent. Now, that's really hard to grasp. But if you really understand the patenting system, you can patent manufacturing techniques. You can make improvements. You can do a bunch of things. So I'm a patent holder, defending my patents in federal court. Hopefully none of you ever have to go through that, that wonderful three years of fighting a big company in federal court. Um, that technology has won over 15 international awards, include, including two Edison awards. Now imagine, I'm in New York, and I get two Edison awards along with Apple, Ford, and Nike and Stephen Key with the spin label. So am I an inventor? No. Yeah. No. I'm a product artist. I love products. Do I have any background in it? No. Why do I think I can do it? I love products. I'm an expert. You're an expert. You know what you like and what you don't like, right? We all are experts here. Yeah. So don't be fooled by it. And one thing, always remember, Companies don't care about your history. They don't care about your past. They only care about what you're showing them today. So it doesn't matter where you live, it doesn't matter what your income is, it doesn't matter anything. It matters what you're coming up with. Ideas are fantastic, and that's the equalizer, because no one has all the great ideas. Um, yes, and I've been educating inventors for over 16 years called Invent Right. I started that with my partner, Andrew Krauss. Why, my wife asked me, what are you doing? I remember I met Andrew at a group just like this. And there was a person talking about, like Adrian, talking about the process, trying to educate, and that was Andrew. And I brought a couple ideas. And I started showing some of my ideas. And everybody was amazed. They said, Steve, how are you bringing them to market? Because you're not manufacturing them, you're licensing those ideas to companies. So he looked at how simple I created the system. It's a 10 step system. So we've been teaching that for over 10 years or 16 years. And if you haven't gone to my site, inventright.com, please do. I've got a nice phone going. Don't worry about it. Um, 
I never thought in a million years we would have. Who is that? Don't you love it? That, no, it's okay. You guys, don't bother me. I'll do a little dance to it next. Um, so we educate inventors. It's a year-long program. And you know what happens because it's a year-long program? We have 10 coaches. There's 20 of us now. It started out with a couple people. We have students in over 40 countries. We have a student here that he's going to come up a little bit later. He's licensed how many, Keith? Huh? 12. It works, but you have to have a road map, and you have to be disciplined, and you have to love this business. But it does work. But you know what I get to see? I get to see licensing agreements every week. I get to see what's real. I get to hear from my coaches. I get to hear the struggles. I get to, get to hear the roadblocks. I get to hear why people aren't being successful weekly with their coaching staff meetings. I get to hear it. And that's why I'm here tonight, too. You guys, I like to hear the real deal. What's going on? Why are you getting stuck? Because everybody in this room should be doing it. And if you've been working on your project for over a year and you're not getting anywhere, something's not working for you, right? Something's maybe you got to change it up. And we'll talk about how to do that. All right, I'm going to dig in. All right, haven't we all been here? That's why we're here tonight, right? I've been here. I've got this idea. What do I do now? I've got this great idea. How many times do I hear this? I've got this wonderful idea, but what do I do? I hear it all the time. I've been there. I think everybody in this room has been there. All right, so this is what you do. You join your local inventors group. That's your first step. It's the best investment you can make, right? You're going to learn so much. If you're not a member of this group, you're making a mistake, you guys, because I know Adrian. He has his heart and soul in this community. He loves teaching. He's, never, he's not going anywhere. He's going to keep on helping. If you have not, if you, if you haven't joined, please think about it, because it's the, it's the best investment you can make at the lowest price point. It's the least you can do. If you cannot join, you should do something else. Go to a movie. <laughs> Go out to eat. Next, books like One Simple Idea. When I was asked to write this inventing book, it doesn't say inventing on it at all. That's a kiss of death in the publishing industry. Inventing. Ooh, gee, inventing. I call it One Simple Idea because that's all I think it takes. I don't think you have to be an inventor. I think you have to someone with a good idea at the right time, showing it to the right company, and getting them to do all the work for you. And that's called licensing. InventRight TV, I talked about that. If you haven't done it, check it out. InventRight TV, you'll love it. Um, web, there's a good website, Gene Quinn, IP Watchdog. I don't know if you really love all that patent stuff. I know Paul, where are you, Paul? You're a good friend of Gene. Gene's a great guy. Gene's developing our, our own provisional patent software for InventRight now, because we take it another step. I told him, look, all that software out there, I don't like it. It's not that good. Because we educate our students months. We, we have them do so much homework that when they write a provisional patent application, it has workaround language. They've done their homework. They know prior art. So I need a provisional patent software that takes the bar and just moves it up this high. He's, he's developing that for us now. He's a great guy. Great law blog. He copies everything. I don't know how he has time to write all that stuff. I think you're writing for him now, too, aren't you, a little bit? OK, fantastic. Uh, USPTO, you guys. I used to think the USPTO, the United States Patent and Trademark Office, I thought they were my enemy. I thought they were trying to keep me from my, my success. Guess what? No, they're your friends. They want you to be successful because you're going to file more patents. Now, the system's a little crazy. OK, we know that. We'll talk about that. But it works. And if you've got a question, they've got an 800 number, call them up. They're very helpful. They're in the business of patents, right? So they're your friend. And I always thought they were fighting against you. They're not. They're for you. But you have to learn how to work the system. And uh, Makerspace is, oh, isn't that amazing? You went to Makers Fair. I went to one uh, the first time. I've seen more, I haven't seen that much creativity in the space ever. And what are they doing with it? Well, here's the magic thing, magical thing about it. They're doing it because they love it. And that's their heart. They should be doing it that way. And if it's something that can become profitable, fantastic. 
And hopefully you can show them how to do that because I think a lot of them might want to do it. In fact, we had one student here, mine, that did the pancake bot. Right. Um, Miguel. Miguel. He started at a maker's fair. He couldn't license the idea, became a student of mine, couldn't license it, took it at a maker's fair, built an audience. And then what did he do on Kickstarter? Put it on Kickstarter, raised over $400,000, got a licensing deal. And I'm in Chicago last year, right? At the kitchen show, big show, 2,100 companies are there. And sure enough, he's got his white, he's got his baker's cap on. He's got this big booth. And he's printing out Mickey Mouse pancakes. He's printing out all this stuff. He's pitching it. He was in his element, you guys. The, the most wonderful thing about it, it started with no intellectual property whatsoever. But he found a way to get around the obstacles. And that's what we want to talk about tonight. OK, licensing versus manufacturing. Real quick, we all know about venturing, don't we? We all know that, hey, I'm going to build this little company, make my little widget. And I'm going to put it up on Amazon or maybe sell it to the stores and I'm going to do all that fun stuff. You guys, fantastic. Oh, it's had a lot of hard work. You know why it's so much hard work? Because as any business, you're going to spend a lot of time. You're going to spend a lot of money. And if you're really successful, competition's coming. It's the marketplace. Now, I've done it before. I took a little piece of plastic and cut that piece of plastic in the shape of Mickey Mouse and skulls and we made these little guitar picks. I became a Disney licensee, eventually selling to Walmart and, and 7-Eleven. We sold tens of thousands of little funny shaped guitar picks. But we didn't sell them to musicians because that's a very small market. We sold it to people that love music. That's a much larger market, right? But what I realized during those four to seven years of developing this country I had to spend my own money. It took $250,000. When I got the first Walmart order, it's for a half a million dollars. That's such good news, right? Where do you get the money? That's the problem with this, right? So, and you're, you're never sure if they're going to stop the ordering. So I love that business. And I wrote a book called One Simple Idea. It's a red book about venturing small ideas because I thought I should write a book on that topic. But what I really like is licensing. Right? I want other companies to do the work for me because I want them to have the marketing, distribution, relationships. They've done all the work. They just don't have the idea. You know what it is? It's called speed to market. It's fast. And today, products go in and out so quick. The lifespan of a product today is very short. Short. A lot of us think that, hey, I'm just going to throw it up on the website or put it on Amazon or do a Kickstarter campaign and, and the orders are just going to come on in. No, you have to create demand. In fact, all those Kickstarter campaigns, those guys that are running those projects, a lot of them are failing. It's really high. Because what do they know about production? Creating demand. See, they think it's a money problem. In fact, everybody here at times probably thinks if I only had money. But it's not a money problem. It's a knowledge problem. That's what's lacking, right? So licensing versus manufacturing, I've done them both. I love the licensing, right? I like the licensing lifestyle where companies are working for me. I can be sleeping and they can be selling my product in different countries. I can collect royalties while I'm on vacation. That's the lifestyle I like because I don't want to work for a company. I'm not one of those guys. I just don't fit in. So it works for me. And I like the multiplying effect. I'm an idea person. I don't want to be crunching numbers, making sure the lights are on. I'm just not that type of guy. All right, here we go. OK, limited funds. Here's a big obstacle. We all think we, we just don't have enough money to do this, right? If I only had money, I could do this. It'd be easy, a breeze. That's not the situation at all. A lot of companies have a lot of money, and they still fail. Right? It's not a money problem. It's a knowledge problem. You need a roadmap. You need a mentor. You need someone that's done it before you. You need someone that's got all the gray hair. <laughs> Simple as that, you guys. If not, you're, you're, you're missing it. it. It's not limited funds. With licensing, you don't need any money. That's crazy. What do you mean you don't need any money? Because with licensing, with a good sell sheet, a one-page advertisement, file a provisional patent application for $65, and give me a phone line where I can call a company I can get in the game for $100 because I can get that sell sheet now made over in the Philippines. 
by a 3D computer generated graphic artist that can take a rough sketch on a napkin that looks horrible and make it look like you can order it now. That's never happened before. That means you have all, you can outsource everything. And the work is spectacular. Go to Upworks, Fiverr, maybe not so much. Upworks, great designers, find one. But they can take your sketch and make it magical for about 50 bucks, 60 bucks, 70 dollars. Why? Why even build a prototype anymore? See, that's the question I'm telling a lot of people. Why even bother? Sell the benefit first. If you cannot sell the benefit first, who cares about the prototype? Oh, that's a different way of looking at it, right? Because the old way is that I'm going to build a prototype, I'm going to file patents, I'm going to polish that prototype up, work on it, caress it, <laughs> and then eventually I'm going to show it to a company. I say forget all that. Put the sell sheet together, show the one page benefit, really strong, we have a one line benefit statement that's so powerful, when they get it, it looks like an ad in the magazine, and go, hey, you think your customers might want that? I can get in the game in the same day. See, that's why I'm, I'm confused. When people say they're working on ideas for a year, when you, could, you can do it in a week. And if a company says, we're interested, guess what? You can figure out the rest. Because you know what just happened? They help pull it through now for you. See, because most of the people I've met, know what they do? They push. They have an idea and they're just going to push it up that hill. I want something that will pull it. And you know what that pull is? Demand. Someone wants it. It's the biggest, easiest way to get a licensing deal. And licensing is basically, you're going to come up with an idea. You're going to rent it to a company. They're going to pay you royalties on every one they sell. They're going to do all the heavy lifting. You still own it, right? But that's what licensing is. If I didn't state that earlier, I'm sorry. But that's what licensing is. They're doing all the work. So if you find someone that wants it, it could be a retail buyer, testimonial from somebody, Someone says, hey, I want this. I can find a manufacturer to make it. I can guarantee I can license it so fast. Just like um, Miguel with the pancake bot. He had demand. We had another student that put a, a Kickstarter campaign, couldn't license it, put it up there. And he raised, I don't know, some amount of money. They went to a licensee and goes, all right, here's the demand. Show the want. Show that people will pay for it. Find that way of pulling your idea through. Stop playing with the prototypes. Sell the benefits. And you can do it fast. So do you, does it, how much money does it take? It doesn't take a lot of money. So forget this obstacle. This is not an obstacle anymore. Throw it out the door. It's not. In fact, turn that obstacle into an opportunity. Try licensing and some of the tools that I talk about in one simple idea. Limited time. How many people have day jobs? Raise your hand. Good, keep them. Because you can do this with the job. You can. Do it on the weekends. I have a lot of students that work full-time jobs. Mothers that have two kids. They still do it on their lunch break. They do it in the morning, Saturday and Sunday. You know why it's so, so easy to do it now? Because you don't have to call companies anymore. What just changed? Yes, LinkedIn. LinkedIn changed the whole game. There's a whole generation that doesn't like to talk anymore. Take advantage of that obstacle. If you're not on LinkedIn, get a profile, look professional, reach out to companies, go after certain people. I talk about it in one simple idea, who you want to contact. Don't pitch. Don't write them a long letter of how you came up with it. Don't do that. Say you're a product developer. Are you looking at outside product submissions? And who could you speak with? It works. We had one of our uh, coaches give a class. I give a class every Thursday night to our students. Ryan Diaz. He did the Wolf Washer 360. How many people have seen that on TV? That pet product? Craziest thing you've ever seen, right? He uh, made a little commercial. Tried to license it to the big guys. Every big company turned him down. Made a little commercial. Put it on Facebook at 70 million views. Talk about the power of the pool. The power of the pool again. Facebook. I remember when that hit, I was watching it was at 6 million. By the end of the week it was 15. It just, it just got bigger and bigger. So sure, my phone rang off the hook. Everybody that turned them down 
wanted this product now. <laughs> of course they wanted it, because some of those companies don't know it until you see the pool. So sure enough, he's licensed it to Telebrands, one of the largest DRTV companies in the world. It's in every Walmart, Petmart, it's everywhere, you guys. So it's amazing the things that you can do. And guess what? He's a full-time sergeant at, uh, in the police at uh, downtown LA. That's what he does. He, has, he doesn't have time to, to, to call. He doesn't have the time. So he does the emails. Every deal that Ryan Diaz has done has been through LinkedIn. Can you imagine that now? I can live anywhere in the world. I could be in any time zone. Maybe English is my, my second language. It doesn't matter anymore, right? So I talk a lot about LinkedIn, how to reach out to LinkedIn with one simple idea, the new revised edition, because that's changed in five years. So limited time, who cares? It doesn't matter anymore. You can play this game at midnight now. It doesn't matter. Protection. How can I protect what I created? How many people have patents here? Raise your hand. All right. Woo, 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 woo. Oh. How many people haven't made money from their patents in here? Raise your hand. All right. That's probably the majority of you guys. And that's a sad situation, I think. Because, you know, if you look at the, the number of patents that are issued and how much money those patents make, it's pretty low. And there's a reason why it's low. I'm a big patent holder, but I, I don't think it's for every project. That's my whole thing. In fact, I remember the USPTO invited me to, to give a speech in San Jose at their, their, um, their new office. And they said, could you bring some books and give them away? I said, sure. And Janice helped write this book because it's a very technical book. And, it's, it's, and the title of the book is How to License Your Idea With or Without a Patent. So here I'm at the USPTO. <laughs> They're giving away the books. They're like, Steve, you're killing us with this. <laughs> but they realize I'm right. Patents aren't for everybody. They're just not. Certain ideas require them. And if you've got an idea that's going to go out in and out pretty quick, right? Some of them are, which is kind of good. Maybe you don't need a patent. In fact, all the licensing agreements that I see, and I see them probably weekly now, we have 30 students in licensing deals today. That's how many I see. And guess what? No one has a patent. Not one. In fact, I don't think anybody's had a patent in probably 15 years. But no one's telling you that. Right? Because of the fear. The fear is that you have to own it. Patent attorneys hate it when I tell them that. They said, no, you can't license anything if you don't own it. And I'm here to tell you, you don't own anything ever. And I learned that in federal court with Legos. I learned it right there, right in front of my face. I had six patents. They signed an NDA. I made samples. It was on a number one hit toy around the world, Bionicles. And guess what? We argued over words. We had a fist fight over three years over two words. And know what you realize? Those two words could be interpreted by a patent examiner, a judge, or jury. Wow. That was shocking. And guess what? I'm not on the inside. I'm not in their club. And there is a club. I learned it. So what does that really mean? That means you don't really have to have a patent in every situation. Some industries, you better have a wall of patents. I'm in the packaging industry. I told you about that little invention. I'm going to pass it around now. In fact, uh, I don't know where it is. Chance, maybe we can get that out back there. Simple, simple idea. I didn't even invent. We've sold hundreds of millions of these. No one's even seen it. I love it. How do you like to have a success when no one's ever even seen it and it's made millions of dollars for me? I'm going to show you that. That's crazy. And I did it someone else invented 50 years ago. So the system is very complicated, but it's a wonderful system. But it's not for every idea. That idea has 20 patents because I'm in the packaging industry. And that was creating a lot of income for people. It was on Nescafe Coffee in Japan. It was in Jim Beam. Lowry's, a bunch of stuff is still selling at some colleges, Yellowstone National Park. You take it, you just spin it. It's really simple technology. But the bottom line is, I don't think you need a patent for everything. So really, do you have a big idea or a small idea? If you have a big idea, you better have a lot of patents. If you have a little idea, maybe you don't need it. Because companies know what they're concerned about now is selling. They want to sell. They don't want to sue. If Apple, with an army of attorneys, 
And how many patents, Paul? Tens of thousands of patents? So many, you can't even count them every day, right? They can't stop it. They can't stop the knockoffs. So why do you think you can? You know what it takes to go to court? About a million and a half dollars. That's a hard check to write too, isn't it? Over three years. And I'm seeing companies don't care. They say they care, but they don't care. What they want is perceived ownership. The ability to file patents. And guess what? Every, all those 20 patents that I have, I didn't pay for one of them. I got the companies that I licensed it to pay them. And if they didn't hit minimum guarantees, I got them back. One company paid me half a million dollars. They couldn't make the final payment. I got them all back. So you got, the game's very complicated. Know the difference between big ideas and small ideas. And that's a topic maybe Adrian can talk more about because I don't think we really do know you guys. I could talk about that topic on loan for, for, for hours on end to know the difference and use the system. So protection, yes and no. Do I need a patent for my idea? Absolutely, 100% no for most ideas. Have a perceived ownership that you might get a patent and you do that with a provisional patent application that's written good. And most people have no idea how to write one that's good. Even the patent attorneys don't know how to write good provisional patent applications. You know why? They're lazy. It's not their project. And we're not providing them with enough information for them to do a good job. That's the catch. If you really want to do a good job with the patent attorney, you're working with them, make sure you build prototypes. They know the one big benefit statement. You've, you've done your own prior art. You've done, you studied the marketplace. So when you hand over this packet of information to your patent attorney, he doesn't have to do any work now. He knows exactly what you need. Don't let them invent for you. Sometimes we do that. We put the confidence in patent attorneys. Don't do that. They're going to execute what you need. And most of us don't know how to do that. And I talk a lot about that in, in the book that Janice helped me write, How to License an Idea with, without, with and Without a Patent. And it also talks about big ideas, small ideas, what to do with each one because they're separate. But also that book is going to talk about how to write a good provisional patent application that has value now. Because you can do it yourself. It's going to take a little work. And you need to be the expert. Nobody else but you. And if you're going to put the work on somebody else, you're making a mistake. It's always going to come down to you to do everything. If someone's going to promise you they're going to do stuff for you, run. Because it takes a lot of work. Perceived ownership. Provisional patent applications. When I told Janice that I wanted to write this book, she's like, you've got to be kidding me. How do you make this fun to read? Right? Because this is not real fun stuff. If you want to go to sleep at night, I tell everybody, just read a patent. You'll, you'll go to sleep. Put you to sleep every time. So Janice wrote it, and I knew it wasn't going to be a big seller. But it had to be written. It had to be. I think it's one of the most important books I've ever written. Because it really gives you the stuff that you're not going to hear. It gives you the information from an from a intellectual property standpoint, from a business perspective not from a legal one. Do I really need this? And what do I really need to do a good job? And how can I create perceived ownership so companies pay me? Right, so companies pay me. PPAs, you guys, I could go on about PPAs, the benefits of PPAs, but it gives you 12 months to shop your ideas around. 12 months! I can shop it. And if it's written the right way, it has value. You see, let me tell you the reason why this works. I'm a big company. And sure enough, the sell sheet comes in from one of you guys, comes in the door, I see it, and I look at it and I go, wow, this, gonna, this, gonna, this is going to fit into our product line. Our customers are going to love this idea. This is very smart. So I bring in the manufacturing guy and I say, hey, can you think you can manufacture this? I think I can. He just made a small improvement on an existing idea. In fact, it's going to fit right in our product line. He brings the sales guy in here and goes, hey, what do you think? He goes, I love the benefit here. Look at that benefit statement. I can sell this to our customers. Brings in the lawyer. Well, does he own anything? Well, it says he has a patent pending. What, has he got a provisional patent application? What's that worth? Here's the dilemma. And this is a great dilemma for us. 
This is the gray area, and this is how we win right here. And I talk about this particular thing in the book. You see, they have a problem now. Because that CEO of that company knows if he had that product, he's going to sell it today. And he also knows it's not about protection because he doesn't want to sue anybody. And you can't stop copycats. Things come out too quick. But he knows it's about selling. He also knows it's about customer relationships. Good product, right price, and really satisfying my customer's needs. That's what he knows is true in his heart. But the attorney is telling him, well, what does he own? Well, who cares what he owns? But he has a good provisional patent that's written in such a way that if they want to, they could file a patent themselves if they want to. So they have the option to do that. You're giving them the option to do that if you write it correctly. You see, I just took away all the risk. Because now I go back, when I see these licensing agreements, and there's always this one line, the grant of license. I open it up. They always want to put a provisional patent application or some little thing to keep it narrow. I blow it open where I can add new IP. See, because if I add new IP, which you're going to make improvements, it's always changing. So now the royalty rate, this is how I get around the attorneys. Hey, if the patent ever issues, pay me 7%, let's say. If it's patent pending, pay me 5 If it doesn't issue at all, pay me 1%. I took away all the risk. Very simple. And I could keep it patent pending for a long time. Because I can keep filing another provisional patent application. Now, that's probably the most important thing that I've learned in 30 years. <laughs> and if you didn't understand that, please pick up the blue book. Because it's powerful. It's powerful strategy. I just took away the risk. I just took away the obstacle from the company right, to take it on with no intellectual property but a PPA. All right. So is that the answer then to the question right there? Yep. Just file another one? Just file another one. Gives you another year. You guys, you know, you can play that game all day long if you want to, right? And it gives you time. If you start selling, then maybe you file a non-provisional if you want to. You can always get a claim. In fact, th this is so amazing about patent attorneys. Every, everybody wants to get this, your, your, your patent very broad. It's not about being very broad. It's just about having one. Because who wants to go to court to argue how broad it is or how narrow it is? See, no one wants to do that because everybody loses. It's a very expensive game, and it's not for anybody in the room here. It's for big companies that have deep pockets that want to argue all day long. Okay, here it is. One of the obstacles is, and I hear this all the time, my PPA is running out of time. I have one year. It's running out of time. That's a big obstacle for everybody, but you, you have some things that you can do if you understand them. If I'm offering my product to license, I haven't violated the sell rule for public disclosure. Let me explain that again. I have one year when I file a provisional patent application, I put patent pending on my idea. I've got one year to shop it around the companies. Now if I don't put it on Facebook, if I don't show it at the local market, keep it private, show it to companies to license, I haven't violated any public disclosure. So know what that means? I can file it again. I'm losing the date. But I can file it again. But how do you prove pull? What's that? How do you prove pull if you haven't disclosed the... You, you can offer it to license. No, but I mean through like your... Well, that's part of your problem too. You can have them sign an NDA, right? A non-disclosure agreement and make sure it has three or four years on it. That's another way to give you more time again. But you have to understand the public disclosure issues, you guys, because this is the real stuff. I mean, you have to play the game correctly, right? And there's all these shades of gray, and not going to go through all of it, it gets very complicated. The bottom line is, some of us feel like, hey, my provisional patent application is going to expire, it's been one year, and I don't have any interest. Either make improvements, file the improvements, make sure companies sign an NDA so you, you can extend it, or just offer it for sale and don't do any public disclosure. There's ways around it. There's an obstacle, there's a way around it. It's never over, never ever over. NDAs. You guys, I just talked about that. Let's move on. Um, talked about that too. Similar ideas. How about when you have your idea and you think it's, it's unique and you find it someplace else? How many does that happen, everybody here? That's good news. You're looking at it the wrong way. 
That's the best news you could have. I used to hate that. On my spin label, there's 500 prior arts. <laughs> 500. <laughs> and when I was in Cincinnati at P&G, making a presentation, they told me we're not going to pay one penny for your idea, Mr. Key, and they slid over all these prior arts. I was a little shocked. But they did me a favor. They told me what to do next. See, prior art, prior patents is a good thing. And I can guarantee whatever idea you come up with, there's going to be prior art. And if you can't find it, someone else will find it eventually. Because I, I think there's very few things that are very new. There's variations, things change, innovation goes from here to goes to here. So you, you're going to learn the history of how ideas come about through prior art, prior patents. So if you find something in the marketplace, see if it has a patent. If you find a prior patent that tells you you need to do two things, read it, read it, and read it again, find your uniqueness. Make sure whatever you're doing is not going to step on their toes. You might have to create it differently, right? Or you really know your point of difference. That's why I like prior art, prior patents you will definitely know your, your, your point of difference. Because when you show it to a company and they want to license it from you, and they ask you, are there any prior art? And if they find it, you have an answer. And it says, absolutely there's prior art. Absolutely. But it didn't come to market. Let me tell you the why it didn't and why mine is. Use that obstacle into an opportunity. Flip it on them. And t all you have to do is with confidence. I'm confident that my provisional patent application will, will be turned into a non-provisional and I will get a patent granted. Who can argue that? Five attorneys could look at it, they'll give you five different opinions. It will never be yes or no. No one knows. So, the good thing is, if you find with something similar, and here's the trick, if it's out on the market, that's a little bit different. Because now you have a problem, right? Because they're selling it. But if it's a prior patent, and I tell my students all the time, and if there's a prior patent on your idea, call the inventor up. That's the best call he's had in years. You see, he's got a $20,000 plaque on the wall that his spouse has been yelling at. <laughs> and you just came to town giving him a way out, saying, hey, look, I love it. What happened? Ask him. What happened? And he's going to tell you this story. Not having enough funds limited time, no road map, all the things we're talking about, he's going to tell you that, right? Listen, and then you come back to him later and maybe say, hey, why don't I license it from you? Do a year contract, right? Share the royalties, cut it one page deal with them, and now you've got a patented product that now you know how to license. Once you understand licensing, that's not an obstacle anymore, actually it's a good thing. Doubt. You know, this is interesting. I'm building, I'm going to tell you a secret here, you guys. Not even a secret. We've got a new program in InventRight. It's called InventRight Connect. I told my group, I want to open, open innovation. I want to change the world when it comes to companies looking at ideas. I want to put together the largest directory in the world of companies that want your idea. We got a team of guys who are going after it. We did it first time when we sold the one book, one simple idea. We did 1,600 companies. I'm going after 10,000. I will go to every trade show I can. We'll knock on every company's door and make a relationship for them. Because I'm going to make it so easy for you guys to be successful. I'm going to build the bridge. I'm going to tear down that door. That's what's going to invent right connect. I'm also writing a new book. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Because I'm going behind the scenes now. I'm bringing a professional film crew. And I'm going to ask those CEOs how to review products. I'm going to ask them about contracts. I'm going to pull the curtain back. And I'm going to do that in every single industry next. I want our group to understand this process, not only from our perspective, but from their perspective. I think we have to have a dialogue with companies. I think we need to know why we're not being successful. I think we need to know why they're kicking our ideas to the curb sometimes. I want to pull it back. It's called InventRight Connect. You'll see that launch in 2017. I think everybody in the whole industry is going to be blown away by it because it's going to be powerful. A lot of the big companies want to sell you access, don't they? I'm going to rip it down. 
Okay. So doubt. I love this. We all have doubt. Am I capable of doing this? Can I really do this? I'm not a professional. I remember one of my first products, Janice. Get that one. Get the Michael Jordan out with you if you have a second. You probably heard this story, but I, I have to tell it again because I love it so much. And Janice absolutely hates this story. This is the way I get her back. Um, I, met Janice at a I met Janice at a toy company called Worlds of Wonder. I worked on Teddy Ruxpin, Talking Teddy Bear, Laser Tag, and that's where I met Janice. She was the product manager for Laser Tag. And I remember she was kind of running the company. She went, she, had, she, she went to Stanford, she got her MBA at Northwestern, and she's up there in this red dress, and she's just controlling the whole meeting. I'm in the back of the room, it's my first job. I'm 27 years old. I've been selling stuff at street fairs. Didn't even graduate from college. A couple units short. I actually went back and got it a couple years ago. So I'm in the back of the room getting down as low as I can. I want to hang on to this job, it's a good one. They don't know what they're doing, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'll figure it out. Now, at the time, Janice thought I was just a tall, silent type. She had no idea. I was just trying to, don't notice me. So sure enough, we got married. It worked. <laughs> and we moved to this very creative town in the Central Valley called Modesto. I don't know if you're familiar with it. And, and Janice became uh, the president, or not the president, the vice president of Gallo Winery, one of the highest ranking women in the history of the company. You know what's so great about this? I know. You hear it. Come on, give it up. So, I'm feeling pretty good. See, I, I had to set the story up this way. So, the, I, I love this. So, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm living out of my car. I got a job. I'm marrying a Stanford girl. She's got the big job. I'm going to be creative now. I'm going to start my own company. We moved to Modesto. My dad's saying, you are the luckiest guy I've ever met. <laughs> so sure enough, I'm coming up with ideas. I love to play basketball. And especially when I'm coming up with ideas. So I came up with this little Nerf game. You know, you've seen the little Nerf games, the square backboards. And I bought one. It's from Ohio Art. And I was shooting baskets all the time, coming up with ideas, being real creative. And I loved Michael Jordan. And they had a little sticker of Michael Jordan. I thought, that's way too small. So I went down the hallmark and got a poster, cut it out, and slapped Michael Jordan on the, on the back. And, uh, and uh, just like this. Like this is a big idea. And so at night, when Janice got home, I had this big sketch pad. I come up with all my ideas. And the very last idea I was going to tell Janice was this, this backboard in the shape of Michael Jordan, right? So, so first of all, don't ever. Don't ever get in bed with your wife with a big sketch pad, guys. That, that's not a good thing. That's the one thing I learned. But she looked at this idea and she said, Steve, I'm really proud of this idea. She goes, you know, the chances of you licensing this idea are about one in a million. Forget about it. Now, how many times have you heard that? Raise your hand. You guys hear that from somebody? You hear it all the time. Do we pay attention to it? No! So the very next day, I sent it off to Ohio Art next day. Spending her money fast. <laughs> and sure enough, um, I get a contract in the mail. And I sent it off on April, I think it was like April 19th, uh, 2000, or 19, 1990. Three days later, I got a contract back saying we're going to do a split royalty. We love it. And uh, the, uh, Laurel, Wilson, Laurel Wilson at Ohio Art said, Steve, we're going to pay you. I had no intellectual property whatsoever on it. Now, let me tell you what's so great about this. This sold for 10 years. I clicked royalties on an idea that it, it cost me $10 to make for 10 years. Beautiful. The first year, I think we did like a million. It was on end caps is everywhere. In fact, let me t it even gets better. Because now it's Saturday morning cartoons. I'm with my kids. And... Uh, Janice is on the end. I have three kids right here. They're a year and a half apart. Shows how smart we are. And I'm on this end. And the commercial comes up. And Michael Jordan shoots the ball. It goes in. He turns to the camera and goes, best looking backboard I've ever seen. And I'm sitting on the couch looking over at Janice. 
So you know what the lesson I learned there? The only opinion that ever matters on your ideas is the company you're showing it to. Not your friends, not your family, right? That's why I like licensing. I can get an idea to a company so quick and say, hey, what do you think? If you really get it down, so you understand the process, I was able to come up with an idea in the morning, file a PPA, build a sell sheet, because I have an office, get on the phone by noon, and go, what do you think? That's how fast I want to know. Am I crazy? You know why I want to know? Because if I'm wasting my time, I'm coming up with another idea here. Because guess what? I want to make a living. Right. right? That came back with the first thing I've told you about tonight. I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I've been able to trace my dreams and hunt them down and make it happen through licensing. And you can do the exact same thing. All right. How much time do I have? I'm probably going a little long. Oh, okay. Fear. Companies will just steal my ideas. No, they won't. I love this. Do they sometimes? You know what I think they do? I think they meet some of us crazy people in this room and we're being unreasonable. Don't ever be unreasonable. That's, that's what happened to Legos. See, I licensed it to a company, they licensed it to another company, and they didn't like the price. If they had talked to me, I would have given them other options to bring the price down. But this company didn't want to do that. Never be unreasonable. Always be willing because they're going to look at this and, and they, they, maybe they work around you. I don't think they steal. Some of them do. There's a few. And I won't mention who those guys are. But they work around you. Don't give an opportunity to work around you. Follow good PPAs. right? And if you have a big idea, make sure patent attorneys are helping you with it. Because when I stopped Legos, right, and I can technically say, I can't say we win. I can't say, I can't, I cannot ever say that type of language, but I can say that we settled two weeks before I went to court. Because that's what happened. But it was over two words. And if I didn't have a great patent attorney that had litigation experience write that, that would not have happened. Right? So there's always two sides to all of it. Right? So fear. I don't think they steal ideas. I'll tell you the reason why. They need us. They need us more than ever now. Now, let me explain what happens in a company. You hire these designers, right? People create out of love. People create because they want the recognition. If you're creating for money, get out of this business. No, you have heartache. Create because of the love of creation. There's nothing more magical than coming up and seeing something, right? Guys, truly it's magical. So imagine you're in a company, you're a designer, and you're working for a company 60 hours a week, they look at your idea, yeah, we like it, yeah, we don't. They never put your name on the box. They give you no recognition. And you're giving everything up. Guess what? Best talent doesn't stay in companies long. And they go home at 5 o'clock. But we're not like that. You see, because we're going to get paid for our efforts. Right? We're going to get the recognition. It feeds our souls. It doesn't feed those guys. So we can out-design them. We can out-design them. So I'm not, I'm not worried about fear because I think these companies know this, that they need us. In the toy industry, they've been working with guys like us for 50, 60 years. They need us. They're going to need us more and more. But what you have to do is be a good inventor, product developer, product artist. You've got to show them stuff that they can understand very quickly and make good decisions fast. You don't want to waste their time. You need to understand the language of licensing. You need to be practical. You need to be a professional. This whole industry has to come together and be more professional. And that's something that I'm trying to teach because if you're, if you're asking for too much or you're sending them a patent, that doesn't work. You need to send them something they can understand very quickly. So I don't think they steal ideas because of social media now. It used to be you tell your friends, your family, people in the neighborhood, now I can tell the world. Do they need that headache? No, pay your royalty. In fact, Alex Lee, the president of OXO Kitchen Company, know what he told me? We love paying royalties. Why not? Come on, give them a good idea, they'll pay you every single time. So this whole thing about them stealing, I think it's false, I think it's old school, I think it's a dinosaur thought. Kick it to the curb, I don't think it's true. Selling. I'm not great at sales. Have your sell sheet sell for you. Never sell on the phone, never pitch on the phone. But if you're, if you're good at it, have your sell sheet and your material. You don't have to be there dancing on the table being this great salesperson. Have good sales material. 
language skills. It doesn't matter anymore because of LinkedIn. Talked about this. Prototyping. Yeah, I love prototypes myself, you guys. I just do. But don't kill yourself with it, okay? Inventory. How many people have a garage full of stuff they can't sell? Any of these? That breaks my heart, huh? You can't even get your car in there anymore, can you? What's your wife saying about that? Oh, guys, there's ways of licensing now. If you've got inventory, you can find a way to get some pool, put it in a couple stores, show it, and then go to a company and go, look, if I can do it in five stores this well, look what you can do if you have 10,000. You can still license it even if you've got inventory. Okay, real quick, I want to say one thing before I end. Um, I have someone here. Keith, you want to come up for a minute? Keith, Keith um, was an early student of mine. And um, he's really stuck with this process. And he's gone in so many different directions. He's gone from dog toys to food items. I mean, the guy doesn't stop licensing ideas. In fact, he shared with me that I think he's up to 12 ideas he's licensing. But he goes, and he lives in San Diego. I don't know if you've seen him before, but this is, this is a good friend and a very right student. And I asked him to come up to share one of his obstacles and how to get around it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me? Oh, yeah. 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 Thanks for listening. Um, yeah, thanks, Steve, for bringing me up here. And, and Steve's been a, a mentor. And, um, you know, going from, I used to work corporate and all that. And Steve really kind of helped me kind of understand that you can get rid of the fear and have a plan in place that you can kind of follow. And I, you know, trusted, you know, Steve's book and his teachings and was able to uh, make it really work. So thank you for all that. And that was, that started, uh, um, a long time ago. I've always been kind of a, a inventor or a closet kind of tinker or whatnot. I, I had my first um, patents when I was 19. Um, before that, I got my first LOI uh, from a company when I was 18, still in college. I invented a, a uh, bathtub toy and showed it to somebody and they put a, a letter of intent on the table. We didn't close that deal, but that's, that's kind of like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. And I was you know, 18, so I kind of, I got the bug really early. Um, but then, it, then I went to do go to corporate, get a job, and that whole stuff. But um, and then eventually came back to what I actually love doing. So uh, I, I have done and have signed a, a lot of license agreements, and I kept coming up to uh, a problem or you know an, an issue that I always thought that when you sign a license agreement with a company, uh, that they could take the idea, they knew what they were doing with it, they had all these teams, they had all these uh, people, and they you could just give it to them and off they would go. Um, my first couple of projects that I licensed, they all got messed up. You know, the product didn't work. The packaging was wrong. The color was wrong. They didn't. They just there was things that they didn't understand about it, and I'm sure some of that was my fault, uh, not prototyping it right or not you know going through all the components with them at the upfront. But once the license was signed, they'd spent a lot of money making the product, and they would go, it would sell and just splat. And I'm like, you put in so much effort and work and patents and whatnot, and then it doesn't really um, happen. Um, so what I've recently started doing in my contracts is I was in the construction industry for a long time. And there's actually something called a, a submittal. So when you're an architect or a general contractor is choosing like a lighting system, um, you'll get a submittal of, okay, let's use that light or this light, little, that light. Um, and uh, the owner gets to choose which lighting system or which type of light or bulb they want to use. So I'm like, okay, wait a minute. I'll just take the submittal form and reconfigure it and put it inside my license and say, okay, and I kind of bifurcate within my license agreement the approval process. So there's a very bland uh, sentence at one part of the section of my license that says, prior to your first uh, manufacturing run, you'll supply the inventor of the license or uh, two ma pre-manufacturing samples. And it just says that, you know, very, very soft. And then another paragraph section down the end, it says all approvals within this license agreement shall use A Form 101. And then so I have my A Form 101, which is basically just an architectural licensing submittal, I mean, yeah, a material submittal that I reconfigured for licensing. Nice. So which is awesome. And it has so much control now when they, if they, before the, park, before the actual product goes to market, they have to get me to sign off on the submittal agreement, but the submittal cover sheet. So that has been... Um, Brilliant. Yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been really pivotal and it's, it's incredibly powerful. They don't understand it when they're signing the agreement. They go, okay, it's, you know, some form, whatever, GPS reports, what have you, fine. But uh, when if something's wrong and you know that it's wrong because you are the inventor and you do understand something that Steve said, there's designers that are just doing so many projects, they're so busy, there's just a couple you know, yeah. components that they just haven't picked up that they should have. And, 
And what, uh, so if you get that signed or you have that kind of I, tool in place, it's been, it's been pretty I, I think that happens a lot, and I'm glad you brought it up. And yeah. that we should even talk about that. Two more minutes, I'm done. Yeah, it's been an hour. Okay. <laughs> what, what's really great, I'll, I'll wrap it up real quick, you guys. There was an obstacle that he saw, and that obstacle was that once he hands it off to a licensee, they can do what they want. And they screw up the packaging and the product and doesn't, you don't collect the royalties. So he found a system to keep their feet to the fire a little bit. That's a great obstacle, turning it and, and, make, and watching it. You guys, this is all about knowledge base. That's what we're talking about tonight. So Keith, thank you very much thank for you. sharing that. Anyway, you guys, thank you very much. Adrian, thank you very much for, for having me again. And uh, keep, keep, keep coming here. Sign up. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Key.